once a month or joins us uh, once a month for putting yourself together after reunion. We also have uh, Danielle Gaudette. She is at the last Thursday of the month, uh, Self-Love Essentials for the Adoption Constellation. And then we have Amy Seek and Amber Jimerson the second Thursday of each month. So you'll want to sign up for those programs. And then I think we have one more slide before we get into our program and that's on untangling our roots. We wanna mention that again as well. Okay, we're really excited about April coming up. If you haven't already purchased your ticket, uh, we'd love to have you join us. It's Thursday evening, uh, starts, excuse me, it starts Thursday evening through Sunday, April 25th through the 28th. That's at the Denver Hyatt Regency in Colorado. I know I just got my plane ticket booked. Um, I'll be joining uh, everyone out there and it'll be good to see some old and new faces. But that's a conference that unites the NPE adoption and re assisted reproduction communities. We've got like, I don't know, entertainment, speakers, workshops, uh, lots of food. It's just going to be a really good time. So if uh, you want more information, please feel free to reach out to myself, Jennifer or Beth. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, 50 plus speakers. We've got panels. It's We've just got a little bit for everything. So that's the joining of the, the communities together. And yeah, the hotel looks really nice. So we're selling t-shirts. We're also, um, if you're looking for, you need a roommate, would you like to room share? We can help you out with that as well. But like I said, just feel free to reach out to us. It's going to be a great time. Okay, at this time, it gives me great pleasure to go ahead and introduce Jacoba Ballard to Adoption Happy Hour. She is from the Netflix documentary, Our Father, is a nat national leading fertility fraud activist in legislation. And at the age of 34, she discovered her true identity that her biological father was her mother's fertility doctor. Learning that it was not a crime, she set out to criminalize this fact pattern and offer justice for fertility fraud victims. She loves sharing her story and the circumstances surrounding her life to help those with a surprise genetic discovery so they know they're not alone on their journey. So everybody give Jacoba a warm welcome. We're so glad you're here tonight. Hi, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we, uh, Jacoba and I met last year at the summit in Louisville, Kentucky. And we had we talked briefly about it. I wanted to make sure that she did come, come and join us on happy hour. So uh, we're glad to, to finally get you here. So welcome, welcome. And yeah, just to, feel free to start in and let's start sharing a little bit of your story, how your whole journey began and we'll go from there. So I don't know if there's anybody in the group that hasn't seen our father. Um, goodness, like you said, at 34 years old, I took a DNA test because I wanted to find out find if out I had if I a have couple it. siblings. So let me start back. My mom and dad on the birth certificate, they, um, he could not have children. So they went to see Dr. Klein and um, my mom was told no more than three times was the donor used and um, that it was a medical resident. So I took a DNA test thinking that I had one or two siblings out there. Um, ironically, it's crazy because you see in the DNA groups of, you know, people saying like their family members didn't want them to, my husband was totally against it. <laughs> um, he said that I've had so much heartache in my life. He didn't want to see anything bad happen. <laughs> he thought that I wasn't going to find any siblings and boy, <laughs> uh, I did. So when I took the DNA test, there was eight of us and there was myself and three others that knew that we were from donor conception. The others didn't know 
because there was three from one family and then a single. So they had thought that their dads had an affair. And then when we came along and we're like, no, we're from, you know, donor conception. And then myself and two others started, it was like every weekend and throughout the day, we'd get a cup of coffee, call each other and start investigating. Well, it got to the point that, you know, the doctor's name kept popping up and I sent a message to what is my second cousin. And I just asked her about if she could give me those people in her family tree, she named off, you know, surnames. And then I came back and I said, are you related to any Kleins? And sure enough, she said, yeah, Donald Klein. And that was pretty much confirmation. Um, and I think that that's why this title is, uh, <laughs> you know, sorry, I get so emotional is, uh, you know, don't touch your hair. <laughs> It made me want to like cut bangs, cut my hair off. And I hopefully, I know some of the men don't understand that, but I think you guys as women, you want to like totally change something because your, your life is such a whirlwind that you want to have control of something. And it's like, you know, don't cut bangs, change the world. And that's what I, what I had to do. <laughs> don't touch your hair. <laughs> so it was really, um, hard for me and there's stuff that wasn't in the documentary and stuff that I really haven't you know spoken about before then um so once you know we figured out it was Klein through the help of a local news reporter because I mean I reached out to every single person and nobody they all thought I was crazy and so um Fox 59 they did DNA test on us which proved that we were telling the truth and thank goodness for Angela Gano. But it wasn't that simple. Um, growing up, I always felt out of place. And I'm sure even though I'm donor conceived, those that are MPE or adopted, I'm sure you probably felt the same way. I feel like we, our lives are parallel. And once I found out I was, you know, donor conceived, my mom was mad at my birth certificate dad because he would never come they got divorced when I was two <clears throat> and it was always you know I'm gonna pick you up he never showed up and so there was a bunch of you know turmoil with that so when I found out that you know I was donor conceived it was even worse because it makes you think like why did you pay for me when I wasn't wanted and I was the same with my mom we had the best relationship the last five, six years of her life. She passed away in 2022. But before then, I was raised mainly by my grandparents. And so it really takes a toll on you. And trust me when I say, like, I wanted to cut bangs. <laughs> I wanted to chop all my hair off. Um, because it makes you question your identity and the purpose of my life. And, you know, you sat back, or at least I sat back and thought, you know, you paid this money for me and I wasn't wanted. Like, why would you do that to a child? But through all of it, my mom and I actually became closer. And I learned that there was a lot of generational trauma. And she apologized for the things that had happened. And I did a lot of healing. It's crazy. I took care of her through her death through hospice and I learned so much about my mom and the things that she did. And I also learned that I can change the world and I can change the world with all of you and everybody else, um, like donor conceived adoptees, MPEs, and I can stop the generational trauma and not pass that on, you know, to my children. That's what I'm trying to do. So, um, Going through the process, I'm going to back up, which you've probably seen, you know, on our father, but um, that was also a like horrible time for myself and some other siblings. We can't prove it, which I do have cameras in my house now and, you know, alarm system, but at the time, um, you know, lug nuts were taken off of my car. 
And my kids weren't grown at the time. I was, you know, taking them to football practice and stuff. And had I driven, it would have probably killed all of us had I not like looked at my tires. We had our computers packed, files that were being sent for Klein were deleted and deleted on other siblings. And also the producer and director of Our Father, they also were hacked. Um, again, I can't point fingers because we don't know who, but, um, and then also even trying to get him charged with anything. He was never charged with any crime related to what he did. He was charged with lying to the attorney general's office, which took three to separate teams. The first team did nothing. The second one, they lost all of the information. And I'm talking like hundreds of emails, links, and everything that we had sent to them was all lost. And then the third came around and all they could get him on because of the laws were obstruction of justice. So I linked up with a law professor at Indiana University. Her name's Jody Madeira. I don't know if any of you know her, but she's a badass. <laughs> and she helped me. And um, I had a brother and another sister that were very involved too. And in 2019, we got a fertility fraud bill passed that um, includes civil and criminal actions now it's not retroactive hopefully one day we can do that and there has been 13 states which doesn't it's not enough but you know it's a start and we um also have been in dc i just got back a week and a half ago we go um from washington dc where we have I believe 49 co-sponsors for a fertility fraud bill um after our father, it was just by chance, um, so Stephanie, or goodness gracious, gracious um, Representative Vice, Stephanie Vice, she actually was stuck in D.C. with nothing to do. She turns on Netflix and saw it and just started watching it. And she was appalled that there wasn't any law against this. And so she reached out to me and said, let's, you know, I want to help you. So I'm so grateful how everything has fallen into place. It's bipartisan. Um, she's a Republican. She included Representative Cheryl, who is Democrat. And there's also Representative Letlow, who also watched the documentary. And she was appalled because her children were also created using IDF, you know, as um, so she took that, you know, very personally. And I don't know, I just, um, even though there's been so much bad, I feel like there's been a lot of good and hopefully you guys feel the same way too. I hope that this documentary has opened up for adoptees, MP, donor conceived people to finally start being heard and, you know, to be able to have access to our truth. Because I know, you know, I, I just feel like for adoption, and I'm not adopted, so please, if I misspeak, tell me. <laughs> but I feel like um, it's, I can't, I don't know, I just read, you know, comments and stuff in DNA groups and how adoptees don't have access to their original birth certificates, can't get it. And, you know, some of them you have to have the permission of the adoptive parents and um, birth parents there I it's not okay at the very least we all deserve like medical history and to know where we came from because I know growing up my whole family had like olive skin dark hair and I kept asking my mom if I was adopted I literally <laughs> um but I was don't have to see it, of course um but it uh, it's a whirlwind it's a whirlwind of emotions and those of you that are just starting out on this journey, or no matter where you're at during this journey, I want you to know that I'm going to cry. We're all important. Your story is important. And you have a tribe of people. 
to help you through it. So, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to go at this alone. I know that during mine, I, I did at that time. Um, there wasn't like a huge donor conceived community. It was kind of just starting out like our generation, I feel like was the first one to really be outspoken. And I guess you could say go against your parents, even though that's probably not the right wording. But we deserved our truth. I deserved my truth. And like when I went public, I wasn't doing it to make my parents look bad. I was doing it because people deserve to know the truth and I deserve mine. So. Absolutely. And if I can just interject for a, a mm -hmm. second. So if, if you if you would please kind of walk us back. So like, for instance, when did your mother tell you that you were? <clears throat> okay, so I was 10 years old. Um, the man on my birth certificate. And the reason why I say that is he is my birth certificate father. But the man that I call dad is my stepdad. Right across the street. He has in the quarters father. here. Pardon me. Oh, I thought somebody asked something. Um, but so this was the wrong way for my mom to do it. But he was supposed to come get me. It was another weekend and he didn't show up and I was crying and my mom was upset because this happened all the time. And she said to me, he's not your dad anyways. And it was like a bombshell, but it sounds so crazy for me. When she told me that, I honestly felt like weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I think partially because he really didn't have a relationship with me. And I didn't feel this. I didn't feel like I owed him anything anymore. And I, I didn't have to ask him and beg for his love. Because if he didn't want to be in my life, then, you know, so be it. So that's how I found out, but um, I was always close to my grandma, his mom. She was the sweetest lady, which I grew up thinking I was, you know, until then um, Native American because, you know, everybody hears that, but my grandma was actually Native American. And so um, that changed my identity, but I asked my grandma and she said, no, that's not true. You're ours. And after she had passed away, I found out that she did know and everything. Um, I asked my dad, birth certificate dad, and he said that my mom was lying. But then he went on to tell me that my mom was cheating on him and everything else. So I didn't really know until I took the DNA test. And that's why my husband was really against me taking it at first. Because of all the trauma I had had. And the people that had let me down, he didn't want to see that heartache again, which I did experience because um, the first siblings, then also some, but um, they did not agree with me going public. And some of them felt um, a need to protect him. And they literally said, like, you're, you know, outing our, our father. But I like I told them I said this is something I have to do I am not um in any way going to stand in their way to see if they can have a relationship with him which that's not gonna happen he's awful man but I wouldn't ever hold somebody back from wanting to do that or meet him or call him but I do feel like what I did was right and went public because whether the law, you know, sees it this way or not, he medically raped our mothers. And he destroyed a lot of, you know, families that had to be rebuilt and, you know, kind of start fresh. Because I have about one fourth of my siblings were, I don't know the exact number, but I know we're at a hundred or over a hundred now, but one fourth of them were actually supposed to be from their dads. And that was thrown out and he used his own instead. So it wasn't just, you know, donor conception, which even then this man lied, said that, you know, he was using a medical resident 
and he would not have even qualified to be a sperm donor. And um, I know this because I found out, thank goodness, through some siblings, the one that you guys saw in the documentary at the very end, Allison, her dad was his colleague and he actually helped him find a rheumatologist. He has um, rheumatoid arth arthritis. So he would not have qualified anyways and he won't give medical information. Um, I actually reached out to him because in 2021, I started getting really sick. I lost 50 pounds, I've gained it back, but I couldn't walk. Um, my cognitive function was gone. And um, we honestly didn't know if I was, I, we thought I was gonna die. I was so sick. And he said, sorry, I can't help you. He didn't even you know, care about me as a human that he had created. So I don't know, it's, um, I have a good team of doctors now, but it's taken a long time to get that way. Uh, when I first started seeing some doctors, they were friends and colleagues of his, and I wasn't properly taken care of. Like I would go, the first rheumatologist I saw looked at me and said, You're, you destroyed his life because they knew who I was. Um, but thank goodness now I have a really good team and I've had, I have my diagnosis and I'm on medication that's helping me. It's like a hundred thousand dollars every month. Thank goodness for insurance because it's uh, a lot of money. And I have like most of my siblings also have some of the same stuff as well. I just happen to get all of it. So. So when you say, uh, when you talk about your siblings, Jacoba, uh, so how many are you roughly, how many are you, you have a relationship with? Well, so when the documentary came out, um, some of them got mad because I was scrolling through my 23 and me and it was supposed to be blurred out. Um, and they thought like I outed them, even though they had posted on social media and everything. And it wasn't something maliciously done. Um, they did end up blurring it out, but you literally had to like pause, take a screenshot and zoom in. Um, but then also too, like I tried to remind them, it says on these sites, 23 Indian Ancestry, it's not private. And if you don't want to be known, you need to use a username or initials. And you can also make yourself private you can't see matches, but they can't see you. And you can turn those on and off at any time. So there was a big rift with that. Um, but I would say probably um, maybe 10 to 15 that I actually speak to. A couple weeks ago, one of my sisters, she met me and we went to listen to a cousin on my maternal side. He was in Indiana um, playing music. He's a musician. So, I mean, I do have some that I'm close to and consider family. But then the others, um, I decided not to even speak to them. Um, they did some pretty nasty things because I was sick when the documentary came out. And I could not respond to any of them. And my mom was also in hospice dying at the time. So I every ounce of energy I had was taking care of my mother. And even after that, I explained to them that, you know, I had been sick and that my mom had died and they accused me of lying. And yeah, um, I think it was what a delusional psychopath or something like that um, to lie about your mother's death. So I didn't have much support. So that's when I decided to cut them off because they're toxic. So, but yeah, your answer, or the answer to your question, probably 10 or 15 that I, I talk to regularly and they're my brother and sisters. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about where legislation is and the efforts that you've made and what's in the works? Okay, so, um, I can put it in the 
thing to if you want to contact you know your legislation or I actually send you the information and maybe you can post it. Um, so we have I believe 49 co-sponsors for fertility fraud bill. It's called um, HR 451. Thanks, Leanne. <laughs> um, but then it's going to move to the Senate, I believe. I'm so horrible with this stuff. And we have um, some that are, I know one is Booker, and I can't, I, I can't remember the other names right now, though, that are, but we have a lot of support. And I fully believe, if not this year, next year, we will have a fertility fraud bill which is long overdue. Long overdue, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So individuals that wanna help support that. Um, it was, yeah, help, how, great thing. yeah, I was gonna say, how can we, how can we, uh, all of us support that bill? So, you know, just contact your um, representatives and, you know, ask for them to support HR 451. And if you want, I can, you know, email you the information. So the more people that we have, you know, putting pressure on them, hopefully, I mean, it's not, this isn't a Republican issue, a Democrat issue or independent. This is the human rights issue. Just like, you know, it should be for, like I said, adoptees and MPs. <clears throat> so. Have you been able to connect to any other organized groups that have found any other doctors that have done similar things on some scale where you bonded together? Yeah. So when our father was released, I believe it said, sorry, my mouth is dry. Um, I don't produce saliva or tears. I can cry, but I don't have the lubrication. Crazy. But um, when that documentary came out, I think at the end it said there was 30 something or 40 something doctors, but there at the time was actually 70 something. Now I believe we're in the eighties, but some of those can't be talked about because of non-disclosures, whatever, because, um, and that's unfortunate that, you know, people have to sign non-disclosures. Whereas I, these, these, doctors should be held accountable and I feel like everybody should know their names but also I understand those that do because when there's not really laws put in place to protect them you want some sort of justice okay um what we can do we can go ahead and open it up. I, I don't want to take up all the questions and I know that our audience is going to have quite a few of them. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then okay. we can go ahead and open it up to, um, let's see if I can stop the recording. This is what, <laughs> what I'm going to do. <laughs> How about a Chromebook? And mine is just a little crazy here. <clears throat> Louise, you want to try? Because it's not letting me. What are you trying to do? Stop. Go ahead and stop the recording. I, I don't. Oh. I can't. It won't. 